It's like a theory, isn't it? Higgs boson. Absolutely no idea. Oh my God, <laughs> this was in the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's probably everywhere. Maybe it's even inside all of us and everything. Uh, a kind of radiation. Kind of got a feeling that it might be something about legs. It's a big, big donut with a energy flying around it and sort of nuclear big bang effect going on somewhere. It's a bit tricky to explain, but let's have a go. The Higgs boson was first proposed in 1964 by Peter Higgs as part of a theory that explains how some particles get mass. Physicists spent almost 50 years looking for it using huge particle accelerators until they built the biggest and most powerful of all, the Large Hadron Collider here at CERN, which finally cornered the Higgs in 2012. Cheers, Peter. All right, I'm getting to that. Now, imagine an invisible energy field that fills the entire universe, uh, represented by this rather small tray of mysterious black liquid. Ah, very good. Now, as a particle passes through the field, it interacts with it and gains mass, like this. Not bad, eh? The Higgs field is invisible, like air. The only way you know it's there is by making a sound or ripple in it. So, if we can create a ripple in the Higgs field, then we can prove it exists. And it's this ripple that shows up as a new particle, the legendary Higgs boson. Of course, you will need a 5 billion pound, 27 kilometer long super collider to find it.
Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And um, I was half tempted to ask Stephen Hawking if he wanted to put a bet on the outcome of this discussion, but it sounds like he might have lost enough money recently anyway on the Nobel Prize. Anyway, I think it should be a fascinating discussion. Um, my um, first guest is Nima Akani Hamed, uh, one of the world's most um, exciting and interesting theoretical physicists He's from the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. He's also an avid reader, he particularly likes the work of Alice Munro, and luckily enough for today, also the novels of Ian McEwan. <laughs> um, Ian, as I'm sure you all know, is one of our uh, best loved, most successful novelists, both are getting critical acclaim and mass readership as well, which isn't um, always the case. He's very interested in, in the subject of our discussion um, today, and he said himself that um, something is missing in our culture. We overvalue the arts in relation to the sciences. And it's at that point that I wanted to start off, before we move on to what similarities there might be, but to this um, perceived gulf. And I was wondering, Ian, whether you could describe for us how you think this manifests itself. Well, that old two-culture matter, I think, is still with us. I mean, ever since Snow promulgated it back in the, in the 50s, it still is possible to be a flourishing public intellectual uh, with absolutely no reference to science. It's, it still can go on, but it's happening less and less. And I think it's less a change of any decision mm -hmm. Uh, in the culture at large, just uh, a social reality pressing in on us. Uh, it was touched on just briefly uh, earlier this evening that uh, bioethics is now a, a, a critical matter. We all carry around with us miraculous tiny machines that involve at least some passing admiration for the, for the engineering that created them. Um, and it's true also you know, climate change forces us to, those of us who have no interest in science, to to at least get a smattering of some idea of, of, of what it is to predict uh, systems that have more than you know, two or three variables and whether this is even possible. So I, I think it's being born in on us. It's, it's now, for example, you, the internet has created you know, sites like um, John Brockman's um, wonderful site, uh, edge.org, I think it's called now, uh, where it's possible for laymen to sit in on conversations between scientists. And, and when scientists have to address each other out of their specialisms, they have to speak a lingua franca of, of plain English. They have to abandon their jargons. And we are the beneficiaries of that. You, in the past, you, you, uh, Nima, you've expressed frustration at people in intellectual circles who have no knowledge of science. Well, it's, it's an asymmetry that doesn't really need to exist. Uh, um, uh, certainly, many scientists are very appreciative of the arts. Uh, uh, many, many of my colleagues are very fine musicians, uh, that, there's, that there's, there's tremendous aesthetic appreciation uh, for, for, for the arts. The essential gulf is one of language, obviously. Um, and especially for uh, our part of uh, physics, and especially in theoretical physics, the basic uh, difficulty is that most people don't understand our language of mathematics, with which we, uh, with, which we use to describe everything we know uh, about the universe. Um, and so while I'm capable of, uh, uh, of, of uh, listening to and intensely enjoying a Beethoven sonata or an Ian McEwan novel, um, and can attest for myself that uh, Ian's a spectacular novelist, uh, it can be more difficult for uh, people in the arts to have some appreciation for what we do. And um, it might be harder, for, so Ian may have to take on, on uh, someone else's authority that I'm a decent theoretical physicist. <laughs> uh, and so that's, that's, I think, part of the origin of the, uh, part of the, origin of the uh, asymmetry. Um, but I think, uh, uh, at, at, a, at, a, at a deeper level, uh, there's, there's a really essential kind of commonality uh, between, uh, at, and I'm not saying it's at, a, at a sort of a kumbaya, why don't we all get along kind of level, because yeah, the, no guitars, there are, please. There are, but uh, <laughs> but there, are, there, there, there are certain parts of the arts and certain parts of the sciences that I think have uh, very deep similarities, uh, cultural similarities, intellectual similarities, and I think uh, these are worth exposing and, uh, and, and talking about and thinking about. How would you describe attitudes of your fellow writers towards science? Well, I think that we, 
it's very diverse. I mean, it's very plural. It's a, uh, we are a vast army of, of novelists and poets. There are more of us than I, I sometimes think than readers. <laughs> um, uh, but within that, I think uh, I have friends who have absolutely well, no less than zero interest in science, and and others who, who have a great deal. Uh, just to pick up on something Nima has said, it, of course, how are we out here uh, ever going to read um, Dirac's equation and understand it? I mean, I, the furthest I got, I, I, I'm one of those know-nothing liberal arts um, students who at the age of 16, remember a math teacher coming into the room saying, I'll take 10 of you who, volunteers and I'll get you through A-level maths. Uh, so us English history, French types went and were patiently taken through. And it was, I'd have to say, the most intellectually difficult and delightful thing I ever did. And the highest I got was the calculus. To understand how it was invented uh, between Newton and Leibniz, I thought that I was, had reached my intellectual ceiling. Now, that's first steps for any maths undergraduate. But it gave me a, it gave me a taste for the sort of respect uh, and I could well imagine a society, and the Greeks had it at one point, where you couldn't really claim to be any sort of intellectual at all or be living the life of the mind unless you had some kind of uh, foot in the world of mathematics. So I think we, we're in a situation of awkward respect. You go into Westminster Cathedral and Dirac's equation is carved in stone. Uh, Graham Farmer tells me that um, it's... it's Elements. This was a conversation we had some months ago. Its various elements are much and, and very beautifully condensed. But to stand there and look at it, uh, I think even for those of us who have very little grasp of maths, it is, can be a kind of aesthetic experience. But it is. It does remain that distance that you were talking about, and in, in periods of the past. I mean, certainly in ancient Greece, but definitely in the Renaissance, you know, figures like Leonardo. It was apparently. I mean, the man was a genius, but he it was possible to span these these worlds at an area of excellence that just doesn't seem so possible now. It's certainly true, and uh, um, uh, making any progress on the on on the questions um, uh, before us today certainly requires. A degree of specialization. We have to get uh, 6,000 people to work on these colossal experiments uh, in order to uh, finally verify theories that were written down 50 years ago, uh, and uh, that's that's not going to happen. Um, that's not going to happen uh, without a lot of purpose. Uh, but I think that, that there is some way of of, of making of making progress. Uh, one of the things that uh, we try to do um, sometimes in explaining what's going on in 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 physics, especially is uh, find useful analogies and, and metaphors uh, to what, 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 might, what, what might be going on. Um, and that, that's, that's, great. that's great to a point, and it, and it conveys some, some sense for, uh, for, for, for what the concepts and the ideas are. Um, but I think that there's something even more fundamental that, that we could be doing a better job with, which is, uh, uh, explaining the, the the structure in which we're we're having these thoughts, um, uh, explaining why we're doing what what we're doing, explaining um, uh, the the pursuit of truth with a capital T, which is uh, underlying all of it. What what it is that motivates people when they wake up in the morning uh, to do these crazy things with their life. Um, and, and to spend one, two, three decades uh, working um, with uh, not necessarily a payoff in sight um, until every now and then we, we celebrate these, uh, these uh, tremendous achievements. Um, there is something essentially uh, that there, there, there is an, an obsessive element to it which should be familiar to the artist. There is an obsessive element to it which should be familiar to uh, many people in, 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 in society. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's driven by the pursuit of something much, much bigger than ourselves um, and of, of uh, being able to connect to something which is much, much bigger than, than the little trivial concerns of, uh, of uh, everyday life. And, and these very questions are ones which have been addressed by writers through the ages. I mean, Stephen Hawking was raised the question of why is there something <laughs> rather than nothing and mm. that, that those kind of existential themes permeate many people's work. Yes, and on that question. It's very hard to imagine an answer that would, 
what, what an answer would be. But anyway, just come back to your first question. There's something else I'd want to say on this, which is that the humanities, as taught in the universities, have actually helped push the, push the two cultures further apart in some ways. Mm -hmm. So when Nima speaks of truth, well, um, in many humanities departments uh, in, in universities, uh, noses will wrinkle. This. That's why I said it. Uh, we, we are, you know, we, we have faced a great struggle. Of, uh, um, the, the humanities have captured the word theory, for example, and uh, really uh, talk of science as, you know, it's just one more game in town, as it were, ideologically. It's related to power, it's related to all kinds of other societal things, and, and truth becomes relative. And I lost a few friends over the onset of theory uh, in, in the humanities. And it, it, it was like a kind of intellectual blindness that fell across the world for 25 years. I think a whole generation of kids were lost. If you went to a university to talk to people about what they're reading, they were reading very little of primary source material. Uh, English literature students even were not reading novels or poems. They were reading how to read such things. And, <laughs> and the whole culture found itself at odds with words like truth. Uh, this was simply a highly negotiable, uh, rather flimsy construct. I think this moment is passing. I, uh, but let's, and then let's hope. It's passing from the humanities into our politics, unfortunately. Yes. Um. <laughs> That's a whole other discussion. But just going back to you, you, when you were saying that you need to e explain your mission, as it were, and the ideas of truth, and you said that um, you, the use of metaphor can, can be illuminating. Perhaps you could give us an example of that. Well, it's, it's sometimes illuminating. Um, uh, for instance, it's, it's something we just, we just saw in this, in this discussion of, of the Higgs. It's a very common metaphor. For, for describing uh, the Higgs particle. It's this idea of the universe filled with something and, uh, and, uh, and the little ball bearing or whatever it was passing through the fluid picking up some uh, inertia. Um, that's, that's a good example of a, it's, 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 it's a good example of a metaphor that gives some, some sense for, for, for what's actually going on. Uh, there's, there's a difficulty with uh, metaphors, which is that um, you can't take them too far. They're not literally what's, what, what's going on. And, and often when that analogy is used, there's some uh, clever person in the audience, normally a 12-year-old kid, uh, who puts up their hand and says, excuse me, isn't that just like the ether? Didn't you guys learn anything? You know, uh, 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 this was, of course, before the Higgs was, was discovered. Didn't you learn anything? Uh, it's really dumb to reinvent the ether. And then, and then we had to say, yes, yes, that was only a metaphor. Um, uh, trust us, that's, that's always when it, we always have to say that's trust us so we know what we're talking about. It's something that fills the universe that's not like the ether. <laughs> um, and uh, so that there, there's always a limitation to the idea of, uh, there's limitation uh, to these metaphors and it's, 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 important, it's important to uh, remember that. Um, it is possible to actually explain some of these things. This is one of the wonderful things about, uh, about uh, fundamental physics. The essential ideas are simple. And in fact, the essential open questions are very simple to state. The possible answers to them are, are more complicated to talk about, but the essential issues at stake, that's what attracts us to the subject. The essential questions are deep and they're simple to state. And with some patience, it's actually possible to, uh, to address them in, a, in, in really a head-on way and get a sense for what's going on without all the details of, 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 of the mathematics. But it requires a very engaged audience, and it can't be done, it can't be done casually. There's a spectacular book about, uh, about cosmology that was written in the late 1970s by, by Steven Weinberg, uh, who's uh, one of the, the heroes of our subjects. Uh, uh, well, Dreams of the Final Theory is yet another spectacular book, but, but even earlier than that was, was, a, was a little textbook, it uh, wasn't a textbook, a little popular book about cosmology called The First Three Minutes. And uh, this is a serious book about cosmology. I, as a graduate student, learned cosmology. I began learning cosmology, not from the textbooks, which I found very difficult to understand, but by reading this, this popular book. And he says in the beginning of this book that this, uh, my, my target audience is a, is a tough old economist, you know, uh, someone who's willing to spend the time and, and actively engage with the subject and try to understand it. Uh, if you're willing to do that, it's possible to uh, talk about all of these things at some 
some more serious level of uh, accuracy. Um, and we could be doing that more as, uh, as a scientist too. So, so I think I, I take us to, 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 to task to some extent for not, um, for, for not, for not doing, uh, for not doing more of that. Because uh, you also get a sense um, uh, when you really understand things uh, a little bit more deeply uh, about how rigid this entire framework is that we're talking about here. It's one of the extraordinary things. Um, uh, often when we talk in terms of these metaphors, uh, you get the sense in your head, well, that's, that's one way things could be. Couldn't it be some totally different way, which would go along with some completely different sets of words that would, that would describe it. But what we've understood about physics in the last 50 years is that there's almost no choices in what the universe can be like. It's an it's a extraordinary fact. And that means that we're also in a tremendous straitjacket when it comes to trying to address some of the puzzles uh, that we face. And, uh, and uh, the discovery of the Higgs by uh, Peter and, and, and his friends is, is, is an example of, of, of something like that, that, that there weren't 15 million other things that it could be other, other uh, than the Higgs. Uh, it was almost inevitable that, that something like the Higgs had to exist and, and it was sitting there and it was discovered in the process of exploring uh, th this very, very rigid and tight structure that's uh, thrust upon us. So um, th that, that rigidity uh, is, uh, is, is, is really remarkable and is something else which allows us to explore the subject with a certain aesthetic sense, an aesthetic sense which is tied uh, to that very rigidity. And I think that's something else which, uh, which, which, which we have in common with, again, some of the arts. I certainly think uh, uh, um, uh, certain stripes of, of novelists like uh, Ian, for example. And, and when you, and you've read so widely in this field, widely in this field and when you, you hear about the rigidity of these structures and recent discoveries, does that change your, uh, the, the way that you look at the world and the way that you look at humanity? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, Nima has written, I think, an uh, absolutely stunning essay for the, for the layman called The Future of Theoretical Physics. Is There's not uh, a line of maths in it. Uh, it's, I, I, I'm not going to pretend it's easy reading, but in fact, it's, you, you wrote it, I think, for anyone who's interested in that question outside the field. Uh, and I think we've lived through a golden age, really, of of science writing, uh, you know, in the biological uh, field as well, um, through neuroscience and through neo-Darwinism. Um, and I often think that actually, if, if one was inventing a core curriculum for teaching in schools, the best way would be not necessarily mathematics, it would be applied mathematics or probability, because there are some things in science that are important that are fairly simple to understand. Maybe not so easy to state economically, but natural selection is not a very difficult idea. But its consequences cascade you know, uh, beautifully. Uh, Bayes' theorem is not very difficult. Uh, I mean, it's almost arithmetic. Uh, and yet, it's a, uh, the applications it now has in neuroscience, again, are, are formidable. So uh, I think we can cross these fields together. Uh, and I'm very interested in, in, in the aesthetics of this, because you mentioned Weinberg, and, and I, I immediately thought of the dreams of the final theory, because in there is an essay on the, the race to prove uh, general relativity. And Weinberg is suggesting that actually this theorem was in the textbooks before the really final proofs were there, which were not till the early 50s and radio astronomy and that what pushed it was it was too beautiful not to be true. And that famous remark, Jim Watson says that, you know, um, when Rosalind Franklin came to look at his, mo his and uh, Crick's model of, of uh, DNA molecule, that it was too beautiful not to be true. Again, we, uh, we come into this field in which the aesthetics of uh, something that is, you know, in the Keatsian sense, beautiful and true, uh, must embrace both subjects, um, all, I mean, all fields, as it were. And this is something that's very important to you, isn't it? You see the great commonality of, of, of beauty between art and science. Absolutely. Um, so, so here I'm, I'm saying uh, 
uh, things that are said uh, much more masterfully by by Weinberg in Dreams, Dreams of the uh, in this in this book. I encourage you all to read uh, Dreams, Dreams of the Final Theory. Um, but uh, we we often talk, uh, especially in, in 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 theoretical physics and and mathematics, of of the idea of, of beauty in theories. And I, and I think if this is interpreted loosely, you won't get really a sense of what 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 we mean. We have to be a little more specific when 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 we talk about it. Uh, ideas that we find beautiful, theories that we find beautiful, uh, it, it's, not, it's not a capricious aesthetic judgment. Uh, it's not fashion, it's not sociology. Uh, it's not something that you might find beautiful today, but won't find beautiful uh, 10 years from now. Or people might not have found beautiful if it was properly explained to them 50 years ago. Um, the things that we find beautiful today, well, we suspect to be beautiful for all eternity. And, uh, and the reason is what, what we mean by beauty is really a shorthand for something else. Uh, the laws that we find that describe nature somehow uh, have a sense of inevitability about them. Uh, there's a very few principles, very, very few principles, and there's no possible other way they could work once you understand them deeply enough. Uh, it's hard to figure out what those principles are. Uh, for a long time, they're obscured, and a lot of uh, progress is driven by trying to expose them. But once you see them, everything else, just one thing goes after another. You don't have to be clever. You don't have to invent anything. You don't have to be ingenious. Uh, uh, the word deep uh, replaces the word clever at every turn. And, um, and everything falls, falls into place uh, because it couldn't possibly be any other way uh, in accordance with its own logical structure. Uh, so that's what we mean when we say ideas are beautiful. Incidentally, we also use the word pretty and cute uh, to uh, describe ideas, and that, that, that doesn't mean the same thing. It means uh, it does sound more diminutively like, like, like what it's like. It's, it's clever, it's ingenious, it's cool, it's nice. But, but beautiful means something else. Uh, beautiful are things that have this sense of rigidity and inevitability about them. And uh, for a long time, I, 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 I suspected that, that the, the truly great, beautiful things in art uh, had to have the same uh, sense behind them. Of course, ultimately, what gives us our sense, uh, um, what gives us the rules, uh, what gives us a sense of right and wrong, uh, which is, uh, and constraint, which is ultimately what the beauty is uh, reflecting, is nature. And these few principles that, that, that govern the laws of nature that, that, that uh, we've learned about and, and we're learning more about. Um, uh, in, in at least some of the arts, uh, that, that constraint in the architecture is something that's, uh, that's, that's self-imposed. Uh, but if the rules are good, then uh, the, then the uh, inevitable things that they give rise to have to have the same kind of crystalline beauty to them. And I found it extraordinary. Uh, about a, a year ago, I, I ran into these, um, uh, uh, on YouTube, I ran in, uh, into this great lecture by L Leonard Bernstein. I, he has this wonderful series of lectures on, on music. But this, this, this particular one that I've told all, all my friends about um, uh, is about uh, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, that the, about the first movement of Beethoven's Fifth, Fifth Symphony. And Bernstein, in talking about this uh, piece that we all, uh, every s s school kid in, in, in the world uh, knows, um, amazingly to me, used precisely this language, not approximately this language, exactly this language of inevitability, um, uh, perfect accordance to its internal logical structure, and how difficult and tortuous it was for, for Beethoven to figure out how to start with da 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 and end it uh, and complete it in this, in this spectacular fashion, such that every note inevitably preceded uh, the one that, that, that came before it. Uh, the, the, the amazing thing is that he found all these, uh, all these discarded pieces um, of, uh, of, 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 of music that, 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 that Beethoven had put in to various places, and Bernstein guessed where they would go in, in, in the movement, and he put them in, and it ruined everything. They were horrible, They're just terrible. Um, so, uh, so it wasn't easy uh, to do this thing that seemed to flow so inevitably and perfectly from that first uh, starting point. Of, of course, very, indeed, very, very important. Indeed. But, but, but I found extraordinary. He used precisely the same language we use uh, in mathematics and theoretical physics to uh, describe our sense of aesthetics and beauty. It's so interesting, though, to hear you talk about um, beauty as being a goal, as an ambition, as something that you recognize. And I just wonder whether in the field of modern arts, just as you said that truth had been lost in theory, is beauty a goal? You don't hear 
beauty much mentioned uh, even by composers in relation to modern music. Mm. It's, not, it's not the common pursuit. Um, I mean, for my taste, all atonal music sounds like an expression of anxiety um, <laughs> rather than anything else. Uh, so uh, maybe, I mean, Beethoven wrote that Fifth Symphony round about the time it, it was for the very last time possible for uh, someone interested in the life of the mind to understand most of what was going on in science and most of what was going on. I mean, in the early 19th century, that probably was the parting of the ways. Uh, and yet, I, I think we do need a return to this in the arts. I don't think we have much trouble in poetry with this. Uh, let's take another look. Seamus Heaney died recently, and so there was a lot of time to reflect on his work. And the beauty of, those line, uh, 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 of his work was constantly referenced. So, so there we're, we're fine. Um, we find beauty in self-organizing systems in, in nature. And Nima and I, before we came on, were talking about this picture and were saying it is extremely beautiful, that thing that's behind the uh, white rectangle there. Uh, created out of utility and necessity by engineers and by, uh, meeting the definite intellectual pursuits of theoretical physicists. Uh, but without intending to, they make a thing, a, a photograph or a, a picture that is of itself innately beautiful. And there they replicate, you know, uh, the beauty of, say, uh, uh, thank, thank you. you. There you are. Ah, <laughs> could you get the graphics off? <laughs> Utility is a, can be a terrible thing. Uh, you know, the beauty of a cauliflower, or, you know, in which we see, um, you know, the, the, the fascination of one bit of it always replicating uh, the whole. So uh, I think there is, there is a need, especially in music, I think, to, to bring us back to this notion. To, part of the problem, I think, was modernism. Of the, uh, you know, the great aesthetic revolution of the early 20th century, uh, to which we are all bound and must work in gratitude for, but we lost certain things. And uh, along the way, emotion and art uh, were, were somewhat detached. When I was a student at Sussex University, uh, we were constantly asked to reflect on, and I even have to write essays on, a statement by the Spanish uh, philosopher Ortega y Gasset, in which and he said, tears and laughter are aesthetic frauds. Uh, this was the pure high modernist statement that you had to detach those feelings about emotion and, and, and beauty from art itself. And then in the novel, we saw it reach its apogee, I think, in the experimental novels of Rob Grier, trying to bring that sense of, of, of involvement of the emotion and the beauty in the object uh, out of the art. You cannot do that with poetry, really. I think it's, uh, poetry is too tied, and I hope we get a chance to talk about time, time both in art and time in, in the dispensations of theoretical physics. Poetry is concerned with the point, that moment of, 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 of human emotion, maybe you know, the lyric poem, the moment of love. The novel, on the other hand, looks at human fate over time. And I really want to ask Nemo whether he thinks time is real, uh, would it return us? Could we then enter the, the fold of theoretical physics if you to assure us that although you might want to abolish space-time, that we could say the universe has been getting more and more complex. It can only do this through time. Perhaps time is real, not just a function of um, consciousness or... Well, certainly in, 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 in every practical and uh, we can have a long discussion about what the world, what the word "real" means, but 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 that will keep us going for a couple of hours. But but that's uh, that's uh, anyway. Discussing what 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 "real" means is probably not not a very interesting thing to do anyway. It's uh, the universe uh, been getting more interesting. But, uh, is that right? That's that's certainly true. It's yeah. it's 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 getting more more complex and more interesting. And so in in every in, uh, so time is obviously a very useful idea. Obviously it it. Uh, 
uh, I forget who it was without, uh, who said, you know, if we didn't have time, everything would happen at once. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so time certainly exists. Um, uh, but we've gotten used to many, many ideas about the world around us, which are crucial to our existence and the way we think about things, which we have come to realize are approximations to something else. And, uh, and now, now we have an, an interesting divergence between really different parts of, of science. The, the vast majority of science is, is really properly focused on understanding the workings of our universe, things we see around us, and understanding it better and better. And, and uh, a, a, a small but important to us um, part is, is devoted to these frontier questions of, uh, um, uh, of, of, of what, the, what, the, what the building blocks are, what the rules are, uh, yeah, what everything derives from. The, right? One of the ruined things but, for us, when you, when you yoked time and space together, well, well, that, and, that's, and that's, so, that's the beginning of the uh, end, indeed. Yeah, it is because, the beginning uh, of the end, uh, for us novelists, <laughs> yeah. at least. Uh, so that when we read that gravity is a function of the curvature of space-time, we think, oh, my God, surely time is a thing in itself. Well, so that, so that, that we already know without any extra speculation. We know that, that, that time and space can morph into each other uh, very, very smoothly. And in, in situations um, like... Uh, uh, Stephen was uh, reminding us about earlier in in uh, black holes, um, what uh, what 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 looks like a direction of time and a direction of space can can merge, uh, can can morph uh, one into the other. So we these absolutely are don't conditions. have. Uh, there are special conditions, but uh, but there are things that can happen. We believe there are black holes in our universe, and this this phenomenon actually does 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 the, happen. The, the, but but I think about where, where but, is the novel without time? Uh, but 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 of course of course there is of course uh, of course there is time does exist as a useful concept as an organizing concept. Um, but many of us do suspect that uh, that space and with it time uh, can't be fundamental and must somehow emerge from uh, something else. Um, there are lots of reasons to suspect that 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 this is true, um, and in fact. Uh, uh, we have circumstantial theoretical evidence that it's true, and we have more circumstantial, uh, less circumstantial, quite solid theoretical evidence that space can emerge from uh, from no space. Mm. Um, but maybe uh, space is the illusion. It could be, and but time but, is the real thing. but precisely because space and time are yoked to each other in this mm. way, it's hard to imagine space emerging without somehow time emerging uh, along for the ride. Because religions want uh, various points have wanted to tell us that. You know, all time is one, and the famous beginning of the four quartets uh, of Eliot uh, proposed time as just not flowing, not left to right, not the present becoming the past becoming the present becoming the future. Uh, and uh, physics have lined up behind this too, an unlikely alliance between physics and religion. Um, I just wondered if you were ever going to rescue us from this. Um, well, uh, and certainly, reading your your essay, I, I got a hint that maybe there was you were a little uh, seeing the future of a possibility in which time might be restored to its unique value. Oh, I don't know how you got no. that impression from my no, essay. <laughs> 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 it wasn't quite as stunning as you said then. <laughs> no, but um, I uh, um, uh, well, no, sorry, but but uh, well, uh, so le but le let me let me maybe may maybe say this. We sometimes say these things that, uh, that that maybe somewhat mysteriously, space time has got to emerge from 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 other building blocks and so on. But if someone comes along tomorrow and says, "Here is my whiz bang theory uh, for where space time comes from." Uh, the first test that it needs to pass is to reproduce ordinary space and time yeah. in the conditions in which we expect that these ideas uh, are actually applicable and useful. That's highly non-trivial. Mm. Um, it's very difficult to, uh, uh, it's very easy to invent sort of random pictures for what might get rid of it, which in no approximation give us what looks like our experience of uh, space and time. And that's one of the central conceptual challenges uh, to this to this program is, is to figure out where the heck could this how, how could this possibly happen? Um, and it 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 could be that uh, that uh, that there are some rules for describing what happens at the very very end when everything is finished happening, mm. um, which doesn't in itself have time uh, built into it, uh, but where there's some 
sort of approximation for figuring out what eventually happened at the very, very end that looks like approximate evolution uh, through, through time. Interesting it, it, that uh, yeah. Professor Hawkins' uh, last illustration gave us, you know, milliseconds, seconds, three minutes. I mean, time was its crucial. And yet, Pull. at the very, very end, he had, uh, uh, he had the, the little jagged line, the quantum gravity wall, <laughs> where all of these notions of uh, space and time appear to break down. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, uh, it, it maybe isn't very, it, it, I mean, perhaps it doesn't do us much good to, uh, to, uh, to talk about this, because we don't know the answer. And, um, and well, very, very, very often, uh, well, no, of course, no, but, but I mean, but, but maybe, uh, maybe uh, what, what I really meant to say um, is that uh, very often progress on these questions um, happens in a, in a highly chaotic way. Mm. Uh, very, very often um, uh, we don't even know we're asking the right question until we happen to be in possession of the correct answer mm. or close to the correct answer. And, and only then do we realize that the cart comes before the horse all the time and we're sort of stumbling around and, and we find bits and pieces of the correct conceptual framework that, that only in hindsight uh, we, can, we can fit together in this way. So we're at that moment now where, where we don't know what makes sense and what doesn't make sense when it comes to thinking about uh, these uh, questions. We just know that our standard description of physics needs some uh, modification. Does, does, does Neem's description of the kind of thought processes going on in science, do you think that in any way mirrors the creative act uh, for a writer or for an artist? Well, I often wonder what theoretical physicists do all day. Um, <laughs> And my fantasy is that they're rather like novelists. They sit around with their feet on the radiator, staring out the window um, with a, a notepad uh, within reach. They're not all in CERN. Uh, uh, there are too many of them. <laughs> and so they must be uh, in the world of, of, of that um, kind of misty, drifting, creative thinking that has a, a, a bit of talent, a bit of luck, uh, a bit of being shaped by current mood that can bring you to uh, a sudden insight or, a, I mean, to sit around and wonder how to progress or even start a novel is, is to um, enter a state of what um, Ford Maddox Ford called, no, sorry, V.S. Pritchett called determined stupor. Um, and those of us who are paid to be in states of determined stupor <laughs> count ourselves very lucky. So, so I, I think that there must be some overlap in this. Well, I, 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 scientists uh, block. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's called my everyday life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, um, I've, 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 I've always thought that, uh, uh, that uh, composers and novelists are, are probably um, very, very close uh, to uh, mathematicians and theoretical physicists psychologically in, in, in how, they, how they go about things. Um, uh, perhaps contrary to, to a certain uh, sort of mythology, uh, people don't go to their offices and just churn through equations one after the other in some systematic way. Uh, to go from A and end up at B and say, aha, now I have succeeded, page two, you know. Uh, <laughs> That's how it's done it, in the movies. It, it, <laughs> it, it, it never, ever works that way. In fact, there, there, there's, an, there's, there's an aspect, and, and in saying this, I'm, I'm claiming no special knowledge of this uh, creative process, uh, that, that this is, I think, common to all of us uh, who, who do this. Uh, and it's, 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 uh, it's, a, it, it's also a wonderful commonality between the very small discoveries that people like, like, like me uh, make and important big discoveries. Even if, if we're not the ones uh, making the important big discoveries, it's, it's clear that, that this process is very similar um, uh, in, in even the, 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 the little things we do uh, and, and the giants that, that, that we revere so much. Um, and, uh, and uh, the process is is a little bit more uh, something like this. Um, you have a certain set of questions you're trying to solve, and you have to imagine what the story could possibly be for what the solution is. Um, you have to you have to try to imagine what the sort of a global answer could possibly look like, or at least chunks of the global answer could could look like. You try on stories. Could it work like that? Could it work like that? 
And, and of course, often because of the, the, the underlying rigidity, the same thing that gives rise to the beauty that, 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 that we talked about in, in all these examples. It's beauty because there is a right and wrong. It's, it's, there's, there is some problem that's, that's, that, that's, being, that's being solved. If the story is a great story, it has a better chance of being right than if it's a crappy story. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and of course, sometimes the stories are too good to be true, and that, that happens very, very often. Uh, and so most of the time, what we do is, 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 is we, we sort of uh, to try out what could possibly be solutions uh, to the problems. And then we have to prove ourselves wrong as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, and that's what 99% uh, that's what of our life is about. We, we, we try out stories and we prove them wrong. We, 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 we make conjectures, we check them against uh, all kinds of data. That, that the data can be data from the real world experiments. That the data can be um, internal theoretical consistency checks on, 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 uh, uh, on what, what we're doing. And it almost never works. It almost never, ever works. Um, so you, 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 you have this experience of failing day after day after day. Uh, and and it's, it's a particularly intensely bad feeling to fail so much because you know what success looks like. <laughs> Uh, and you can't fool yourself when, 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 when you're not there. So, so uh, even though you don't know what the solution is, uh, you know when you don't have it. Um, and so you have to keep going and going until uh, gradually you fail better and better and better. And every now and then, once every two or three years, uh, something works. And Sounds even worse than stupid. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that, well, no, that is stupid, I think. Uh, that's a perfect description of it. Um, but it's fascinating, uh, this idea of competing narratives, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, I mean, the, the, here is a major difference. I mean, because Nima has got a clear sense of, of what would be right, and there are, there are you know, um, although I have to say, you know, multiple universes, 11 dimensions, sounds fantastically inelegant to me, but uh, 11, you know, and it was 10. It was, I think you were onto something when it was 10. 11. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, this brings us to, 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 to another point of, is it divergence as well as uh, some convergence, which is originality. Uh, I'm well aware in science how important it is to be first. Um, be second with um, structure of DNA will consign you to the dustbin of history. Whereas every novelist knows that he or she, a uh, terrible novel, is unique. Um, you are in a self-sustaining world in which whatever you say is so. It's for others to accept it or reject it. So we do have battles every now and then. A plagiarism storm comes up. But there we know what we're talking about. But I, I often pity uh, those scientists who are in a race um, just to get on the public record for the first time days, weeks before someone else, uh, and your life can be transformed. I mean, uh, Crick and Watson are a perfect case of this, and the double helix, by the way, I think is one of the most eccentric and beautiful uh, books of how a, a, a scientific discovery is made, and all the contingencies that around that, and all the personalities. But if Powling had got there before them, we, we wouldn't have heard of, we certainly wouldn't have heard of Jim Watson, I think. We would have heard of Crick in a later time. And Jim Watson himself uh, has said, it was the luckiest thing it was to meet Crick and be um, involved in this sort of personal chemistry that drove them forward. So it's a, it's a tougher world, I think. Yes, real anguish this, is, there, this yeah. is a this is of course a, a, a fascinating subject because it's one of the it's one of the classic things uh, that, that that we talk about for the difference between uh, between art and science. Um, even here, I think there's there's more there's more commonality than uh, than uh, meets the eye, which I'll get around to in, in a second. But I, I, I want to say one thing about uh, about um, uh, originality at an even sort of baser level of uh, uh, how easy it is. Uh, to be original, how much uh, sort of innate, intrinsic talent is needed to, to be able to do something. And here we actually have, I think, an advantage. And, uh, and the advantage is precisely that there is this thing out there uh, that, uh, that we're not inventing, but we're discovering. Uh, and because of that, all you have to do is get somewhere in the neighborhood of the truth. Um, you don't have to get particularly close to it. You just have to know that it's there. 
And then you have to not fight it and just let it to drag you in toward itself. Um, if you're very talented, you might hack your way there more quickly. If you're less talented, you might have to uh, uh, pinball around and it takes a little longer to get there. But if you're in the basin of attraction of a, of a correct idea, um, uh, you have a very powerful friend, which is uh, ultimately nature itself uh, and the powerful consistency of these ideas themselves that, that drag you towards it, regardless of, um, of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of really, at some very deep level, the, the, the aptitude you have for, for, uh, for the questions involved. Um, this is something we see over and over again. There, 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 are, uh, there are a wide range of, uh, of, uh, of talents, especially in uh, theoretical physics, that are represented for major discoveries. And, um, uh, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's for this reason. It's because it's, you're not really inventing something. You're discovering things that are out there already. And, uh, when, and, and when you have to get close, and that's, that's, that's mostly what, what you have to do. That fateful morning you know, when, when one of his children, two-year-old, was extremely ill and Darwin opened a 20-page letter from Wallace right. and said, you know, all my originality is smashed. And it was only his friends who said, no, here's a scheme, you know, come, come before the Linnaean Society and fortunately D comes before W in the alphabet. <laughs> um, and that was the convention at the Linnaean. Uh, we read paper from Darwin, paper from Wallace. But the anxiety attack right. that Darwin had there, no novelist could have such a thing. But, but Unless the, you're in a world of a Borges story, you know, the, um, Pierre Menard, who rewrote Don Quixote word for word without actually copying it, just reinvented it. This doesn't actually happen outside of Borges. Um, but but this, 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 this very fact that... Uh, um, uh, that, we're, that we're both talking about that, that makes it possible for multiple people to uh, discover the same thing at yeah. the same time. On the one hand, seems to, uh, seems to remove, um, in, in some deep sense, the, the, uh, the purpose of the individual scientists in the process. What you're talking about, the anxiety, uh, who gets the credit, and so on, uh, this is important to the individuals involved. It's of no importance in the grand scheme of things. No. Uh, obviously. Seen by funerals. And, uh, right. Um, so, um, uh, but uh, there is an important sense in which even the same discoveries, um, even the same existing body of knowledge, the things that are sitting there in textbooks for hundreds of years already, are perceived in different ways by different individual scientists who are, uh, who are, who are practicing researchers in, in, in the subject. And, uh, and it's because to, to, to be able to do anything new uh, you have to organize the existing body of knowledge and what, what came before in some unique way, some unique way that's your way of thinking about it. That's not someone else's way of thinking about it. Um, and it, it can't just be about the new things. It really has to be about everything. It's one of the real pleasures in our, in our business of, of, of getting, getting to know your, uh, your, 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 your colleagues. Um, uh, isn't just about the, the, the latest, greatest thing they're working on, but, but they have some view, some perspective on, on all of physics that, 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 that comes before it that, that organizes even the most basic standard things that we all know inside out in, in different, quite unique, quite, quite, quite fascinating ways. And, and one of the things which is uh, one of the more invariant reasons, not just, uh, not just who gets the credit, but, uh, but, but one of the deeper reasons why it's important to have different people approaching the same problem, even if they end up uh, uh, solving it and finding the same solution, is the path towards a solution uh, suggests many divergent uh, ways things could progress in the future. And having many of those paths is still useful. Um, uh, it's not always useful, but it's been, it's been useful many, many times. The, 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 the different ways in which you see uh, the ideas and, and, and the object, the different emphases, the different perspectives, um, suggest different ways the ideas can be generalized, different, uh, different things that can come first, to different starting principles. Um, and so, uh, so it still pays off to have uh, lots of people uh, doing the thinking. Uh, a, a, a really great example is, uh, is general relativity. Um, so, so Einstein had this very geometrical point of view about uh, where, uh, about, about gravity and space-time, the things that, that we say in all the popular books, which is definitely correct, and, uh, and, and played a, a, a big role in his own development of, of, of the subject. Um, but 
but over the years, we, 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 we discovered impact. totally different ways of, of, of thinking about, about the same physics. Uh, and um, and uh, uh, so it's not obvious ahead of time uh, whether the first way you discover something ends up being uh, the best way to eventually think about it when you have to make, make the next steps. So even in this case, it's not quite as bad. <laughs> um, even though it, 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 people, there is the sting of being scooped. Um, but uh, those are all basic trivialities, that there's still some good purpose in, in, in having uh, different, different paths and the and same then, outcome. As we begin to draw this discussion to an end, I, I'm aware that I haven't really asked you in very much about the influence of science on your own work. I mean, clearly you're reading widely for its own sake because you're engaged and interested, but it has influenced some of you, I mean, particularly solar, I, I, I would suggest. Well, it has, but um, it, it's, I think, Novelists are lucky that they can, you know, sitting down to write a novel is roughly about the time of an undergraduate university course. Mm -hmm. And you might draw on uh, the work of a historian, you might need uh, to read a biography of a composer, or you might... In other words, I, I would like to feel that we could think about science as just one more aspect of organised human curiosity, rather than as a special mm -hmm. compartment. And it has, as uh, it's been very clear, I think, from this discussion, a, a powerful aesthetic. Um, it also has, you know, wonderful human clashes and, and all the rest of it, as does every other uh, human field. But I think we need to generalise it. We need to absorb it into our sense that we can love uh, the music of Beethoven without being composers, uh, without being musicians. And we could love science as a celebration of human ingenuity without uh, being scientists or mathemat mathematicians. It has had a huge effect on my own sense of the world. It certainly has uh, helped me along the way to a, a general uh, embracing global scepticism about religion. I don't think these are two distinct... Uh, Magisteria, I think they're entirely opposed. Uh, the world of faith is, I think, inimical to, to the world of science. Uh, and in that sense, uh, science has helped me uh, want to write books every now and then which are in celebration of, of um, a, a full-blooded rationalism. It's one of our uh, delightful aspects and it informs uh, what we try to do with our laws and our legislations and our social policy. We don't succeed uh, a lot of the time. It's very hard to, to make human institutions that are irrational, but the impulse is powerfully there. And we uh, despair of human relationships at the very most private level when they're irregular or contradictory. We, we demand even of our lovers a degree of coherence. Uh, and behind that lies a notion of consistency and, and rationality. So uh, science music is, is one case of, of that. Uh, and the, the novel I wrote, um, Enduring Love, was actually a, a novel in wishing to oppose uh, the romantic notion that uh, abstraction and logic and rationality, and science in, in particular, uh, was a cold-hearted thing, a myth, I think, which began with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, we, need, we need to reclaim our, our own sense of, 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 of the full-bloodedness, of the warmth, really, of what's rational. Celebration of the rational, the final word from you, Neem. I'm sure that's something you'd agree with. He said it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fantastic. Well, look, we are we really have a kind of overrun our time, but it was such an interesting discussion. So I want to um, thank you both very much indeed. Thank you very much to the audience for. I hope you enjoyed our I think, our brief history of beauty, art, truth, and indeed time. Thank you very much indeed to both of my guests. Thank you very much. <laughs>